Hello everyone and welcome to this discussion on the education of refugee children in the Middle East. This discussion is being hosted at the European Parliament following a seminar this morning which was organized by the Socialist Democrats of the European Parliament, UNESCO and UNRWA. The Middle East was and still is the theater of many conflicts. Most of them have become humanitarian protracted crises, leaving millions of children out of school and severely affecting the national education systems. Unfortunately, the protection and education of children in emergencies are among the humanitarian actions that attract the least amount of funding. We know that education is a pillar for recovery and resilience, and that it could be a fundamental tool to bridge the gap between humanitarian aid actions and development operations, often referred to as the humanitarian development nexus. Today, our guests are Enrique Guerrero Salom, member of the European Parliament, Ms. Yayoi Seji Vilcek, UNESCO Senior Program Specialist for Education, and Ms. Caroline Pontefract, UNRWA Director for Education. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. The European Union and its member states are the largest donors when it comes to humanitarian aid interventions. The contribution from the European Commission to education in emergency went from 1 to 6 percent between 2015 and 2017. And the European Commission said that it would further increase its budget to 8 percent in 2018. So Mr. Guerrero Salom, as the standing rapporteur for humanitarian aid at the European Parliament, could you please tell us more about the work of the European Parliament in education and emergencies? Let me start saying that uh, to reach the 8% of uh, the total of the budget for humanitarian aid is a great success for the European institutions as also for the European Parliament. Because we have been supporting Commissioner Stylianidis in this effort and we try to uh, implement uh, uh, amendments <coughs> that we presented in the Budget Committee of the European Parliament in order to increase this amount of resources for education in humanitarian crisis. But it's not only uh, uh, money. We support from uh, the European Parliament a whole approach to the education in humanitarian crisis. Everyone that has experienced um, the will of the refugees, mainly the mothers of the refugee children, uh, all, all of them, myself, we know that the first uh, requirement to the humanitarian actors is to provide education for their children. They are ready to accept less food, to accept uh, not so good shelter, but uh, they want opportunities for the life of the children. And so in the European Parliament, we have promoted a report on uh, education in humanitarian crisis. The reporter was Linda McAvan, who was the chair, who is the chair of the development committee. We put a question, uh, oral question, to the Commission in the European Parliament uh, plenary session, followed by a report also and a resolution in which we try to Im implement uh, the efforts of the uh, EU. Uh, concerning education in humanitarian crisis. So it's uh, from one side, we are supporting more resources, but from other side, we are putting the focus on the need to consider the education a priority, responding to the crisis, because this is the priority of the people suffering this situation. And how do you think that the European Union and its partners, such as UNESCO and UNRWA, can strengthen their cooperation in order to better link uh, humanitarian aid actions and development intervention? Again, in the European Parliament, and especially in the uh, De Development Committee, we have uh, elaborated a report on resilience that try to link the humanitarian response and the development resilience for the uh, situations in which uh, the first aid is always humanitarian. So the position of the, of the parliament is to uh, close, close uh, the responses and uh, strengthen this link. Let me tell you that uh, today, in some ways, a sad day, because the uh, United States has decided to withdraw 
uh, UNESCO, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, ask the European Union to upgrade our commitment supporting UNESCO and supporting UNRWA and supporting other organizations that are providing education in a humanitarian crisis. Uh, people must know that uh, in some of those humanitarian crises, we are uh, dealing with a problem of decades. And some of those uh, humanitarian crises will last with us for decades. And we have to provide opportunities for generations, not only for the uh, young people that are now in this situation, but also for next generation that will born and uh, grow in this uh, humanitarian landscape. So, to conclude, I think that we have to strengthen our connection with uh, uh, UNESCO and UNRWA, but on the second part of my speech, we have to upgrade our commitment because the U.S. is uh, as they did in many other opportunities in the last 50 years, withdrawing or not supporting UNESCO, which is the uh, office of the United, the agency of the United States or the uh, United Nations for Education. Mm -hmm. I know that time is limited for you, so I'd like to thank you very much for your interesting points, Mr. Guerrero Salom, and thank you very much for hosting us as well. Thank you, and thank, thank you, you. Thank, you. thank you all of you. Thank you for having us. So I'd, uh, I'd like to move on to uh, Ms. Segi Vilcek, because UNESCO is the leading uh, UN agency for education. And this morning, during your intervention, you spoke about the impact of crises on education, more specifically in the Arab region. So as the Senior Program Specialist for Education in the UNESCO Beirut office, could you share with us UNESCO's strategic direction on education and emergencies, but more particularly when it comes to bridging the humanitarian development nexus? Thank you very much. Um, I just want to first of all acknowledge the partnership we've had with uh, UNRWA for 70 years. And I think as we focus on uh, bridging the, the humanitarian development nexus, as has been also mentioned by, by Mr. Guerrero Salom as well, I think we can learn a lot from each other, in particular a lot from UNRWA's uh, the work, a tremendous work for the past 70 years. And I think uh, there's no other agency in the region or around the world who's had more experience in this field. So very much looking forward to strengthening partnership with UNDUA. But uh, back to the question about uh, strengthening um, the nexus of development and humanitarian, I think it's important to recognize, first of all, that we are talking about the same children, same yes. young people, same parents, mothers and fathers, and same Ministry mm -hmm. of Education, the staff, community people who, are, who have been suffering from crisis for, for many, many uh, years and for decades in our region, in our region. We're talking about the same people. So there's no point just because funding may come from different channels, different organizations, to start fragmenting who should be targeted in humanitarian and who should be in development. Even more so in the field of education, because we are talking about people who are on the move. The refugees and IDP, internal, internally displaced persons, they're on the move all the time from one location to another, one country to another. So the continued provision of quality learning opportunities is essential, regardless of where they are. And we need to support the children, young people, and also parents to be able to appreciate that, gain the knowledge, skills needed for their life and work. So from UNESCO's perspective, uh, not, not only because of it, education is a fundamental human right, we stress this need to, to, to strengthen the national education systems to make it possible for children, young people to access education, remain in the learning institutions and gain knowledge and skills for their own future. Um, but uh, we need to focus on, on the ministries of education and strengthen their capacity so that they have policy frameworks, strategies, and also needed data for them to plan properly, to be able to handle shocks. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Mr. Guerrero Saram has mentioned, uh, it's the resilience mm -hmm. in education system is crucial. Mm -hmm. So that's really UNESCO's approach, looking at the policy framework, mm -hmm. strategies, and also making sure that mm -hmm. evidence is available, be it research, be it hard data, to inform planning, inform budgeting, and financing processes, which many mm -hmm. countries really do, who have been affected by crisis mm -hmm. do recognize it's a major gap. So crisis, 
while it's been affecting millions around the world, particularly in our region, in our region is an opportunity um, to, to improve education provision. And that is really the UNESCO puts a lot of focus on the systemic approach. I think Caroline yes. has mentioned a lot about mm -hmm. it, a lot of experience uh, to tell us about more. I think it's, it's quite critical to focus on, on the systems mm -hmm. so that it can be more resilient, it can be responsive mm -hmm. to crisis as and when it happens. And we hope it wouldn't last so long, but unfortunately in our region we're talking about a protracted crisis. Mm -hmm. So even more so, we have to look at the system strengthening mm -hmm. as such. You've highlighted uh, the, uh, the partnership between UNESCO and UNRWA, mm -hmm. and uh, UNRWA is the United Nations agency in charge of providing protection and assistance to over 5 million Palestinian refugees in the West Bank, mm -hmm. Gaza, Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. Mm -hmm. And UNRWA runs close to 700 schools mm -hmm. and eight technical and vocational education and mm -hmm. training centers in the Middle East. Yes. So, Ms. Pontfract, mm -hmm. as the UNESCO Director of Education at UNRWA, mm -hmm. Could you provide us with some mm -hmm. insights into key dimension mm -hmm. and challenges mm -hmm. that you are faced with mm -hmm. while providing education to Palestinian refugees and what kind of solutions you're finding? Right, <laughs> okay, a big question. So thank you very much, first of all. And really, I think that yeah, you always said so much that I would say we have very much the same approach. And I would like to say that UNRWA Support, is supported by UNESCO. I am actually employed by UNESCO and UNRWA set up the UNESCO education program and has supported it ever since through technical support. I think that UNRWA we have 522,000 children in our schools so we are you know we are the, the humanitarian development divide. Every day we are trying to develop our children, trying to develop their skills but at the same time we have to respond to crisis whether it's a Gaza war, the Syria crisis, we have challenges in the, our West Bank field in terms of children's access, we have challenges in Lebanon. So we really are a kind of implementation agency. So every day we open our doors to 522,000 children. So we have to actually be able to, to address the needs of those children. And I think really echoing what Yao Yoy said is to build resilience. Resilience isn't something that you can build by, you know, one, one tiny approach or a teacher training program or doing something with the children. It's about having a strong system, a system which where the children are valued and supported. So when they come to school, they feel safe, their potential is realized, whatever that potential may be, whether it's educational potential, whether it's social potential or arts potential, a system which actually values them, raises their potential, a system that works with the, with the host country, because we were operating in five different host um, situations, uh, a system which works with all the stakeholders. And I think that's what has been UNRWA's response over the last six, seven decades, is putting a very strong system in place. So we have a strong system in place in terms of uh, our teachers, in terms of our, our school principals, and that has been how we've responded to the crisis. So with both the Gaza war, uh, most recently the 2014 war, and the Syria crisis, we really worked to see what we could do to deliver quality education, although you know, the world was falling you know, down around these children. And what I was saying this morning in the panel is that we have the same objective. We never give up on quality, inclusive education. But instead of going for it like this, we have to kind of achieve it like this. So we have to use innovative approaches. We have to think about children who can't come to school, who maybe we give them self-learning materials. We have to think about communication with parents so that they know when to keep their children at home. So we have an SMS system. We have to think about the support the children need, you know, psychosocial support, and that doesn't mean something, you know, very, very technical. It can just mean more opportunity to play, recreational centres, opportunity to, to be together, you know, to have art lessons and, and sometimes counselling. And we have to also think about safety and security, you know, so our children know what to look for and the school knows how to prepare and respond to a disaster. So I think our challenges has been trying to run a system trying to strengthen that system in an ordinary development you know, way in terms of trying to build that system to do the best by our children, but then be able to respond to many, many challenges, you know, in all our fields. And it kind of varies, as I said, the, the challenge of the last few years has been Syria, but in the midst of the Syria crisis, we had the Gaza war, and that was actually quite, you know, devastating, the effect that had and on our children and, and on, the, on the education. And we really had to work to kind of, to build the system up again afterwards and try to, to help the children in their recovery. So I think the challenge is 
to how you can balance that, how you can continue to strengthen the system, which is not supposed to be a durable system. We ask, we are UNRWA is there until there is a just and durable solution. Mm -hmm. We've been waiting seven decades for that. <laughs> we hope it's coming soon, but while we're there, we will do you know, the best we can in terms of quality education. And while we're there, when there's a crisis, we will do the best we can to enable the children to continue to have quality education even during that crisis. And I believe one of the key words that mm -hmm. you said was values, the yeah. values that mm -hmm. you teach children. Because yeah. mm -hmm. I believe that education is a lot more mm -hmm. than just textbooks mm -hmm. and tests. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. also about teaching the values and principles yes. that allow okay. children to mm -hmm. grow and become an essential yes. part of, yeah. of their societies mm -hmm. and, and the world. Mm -hmm. And I think it's even more important mm -hmm. uh, for children living in situation yes. of emergency because okay. they mm -hmm. probably witness violence and injustice on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So. Could you explain briefly what UNRWA does to instill yeah. its students a common set of key values mm -hmm. to help them become a global citizen? Yes. I think that's very important. I think that we really want our children to be informed, to be critical thinkers, mm -hmm. to have uh, the difficult context they live within. We want them to have informed ways of trying to address it. You know, we want to empower them. We don't want to disempower them. So everything from the way we, we try to encourage our teachers to work and our school principals to work is to empower the children to think, to ask questions, you know, to actually to learn to learn as opposed to you know, being taught uh, facts. So that's very important and that's at the heart of what we do, to teach children to think, to teach them to learn, to teach them to empathise mm -hmm. with each other and to be social creatures, to work together, you know, to, to find solutions together to everyday you know, school uh, subject-based challenges. But then we also have a human rights programme. So we started the human rights programme since 2010, but in the last seven years we've really worked to strengthen that. It's called Human Rights um, Conflict Resolution and Tolerance. And we have a, a policy which determines what we want to do and a strategy, how we're going to do it. And then we've done some very tangible things. So we have a school parliament in every school. So in every school uh, our children vote for a representative, someone to represent them with regard to issues of the school or maybe issues in the community to engage with. And now we have just moved, uh, at our Commissioner General's initiative actually, we've moved towards an agency-wide parliament. So in each field, because our operations, we call them fields, when we're working in Syria or Jordan, that, that is a field to us, there is a, a, a representative elected who represents all the school parliaments in that field. And they then are the agency parliament. We just had two school parliamentarians at the UN, at uh, meetings at the UN General Assembly with our Commissioner General. We brought school parliamentarians along to meet all our donors. So we actually, we want the voice of the children to be heard. So when we're having these dialogues with high level stakeholders, we bring the school parliamentarians along to talk, uh, talk about what they want and what they want from education. And they say the same, that they want to be empowered. They don't want to be seen as victims. You know, they want, they want to understand other cultures. They want to kind of work together, you know, and, and they very much reflect those values. And I think for actually for whether it's our donors or it's our other partners, seeing the children talk, you know, and hearing them, reflect that. He's, that's very, very important. So we've done a lot of work with regard to that and we have human rights integrated into all our subjects. We're still working a lot on that but we have various instruments so that we really are teaching children about diversity and about tolerance etc. So I think it's a really big part and I think many of our host countries have been quite interested in what we're doing and even UNESCO I say even UNESCO, especially UNESCO has worked, has wanted to know more about our human rights programme in the context of their global citizenship work and we have shared in, in international forums the work that we do on human rights. So we really take this particular explicit focus as well as an implicit focus I think through our classroom approaches. Thank you very much for these uh, interesting uh, points. Our uh, discussion is coming to okay. an end so I'd like okay. to thank both of you and thank I look you. forward to pursuing thank this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.